Good morning and welcome to today's event. I'm Mira Trahan, Associate Director of Programs at the American Constitution Society for Law and Policy, also known as ACS. For those of you unfamiliar with ACS, we're a national network of lawyers, law students, and policymakers dedicated to ensuring that the fundamental values of individual rights and liberties, equality, human dignity, and access to justice enjoy their rightful central place in American law and policy. Now on to today's program. We have a fabulous panel of experts here today to talk to us about two cases before the Supreme Court on Indiana's voter ID law. Now, one nice, as an aside, one nice thing about these cases is that they remind us not every important election law related development comes out of Iowa or even New Hampshire. And uh, it's nice to see so many of you here today recognizing that too. Today's panel will discuss the upcoming arguments in the Crawford versus Marion County um, Board of Elections case and the Rokita um, case. But we're also going to have a discussion a little bit broader than that. The panel is going to discuss what the ramifications of a court's decision might be on the proliferation of voter ID laws throughout the country and what the court's decision might mean for future voting rights challenges. Our panel today will be moderated by Tova Wang, who is a nationally recognized expert on election law and currently a democracy fellow at the Century Foundation. Tova? Thanks very much, Mira. Um, thanks for coming out today. I know it's freezing, although probably not as freezing as Iowa, so I guess you can be thankful for that. Um, I'm just going to start out giving you a sort of uh, broad overview of where we are in terms of voter ID laws throughout the country and where we are with litigation nationally as well, and then sort of set the stage for um, what the uh, Indiana litigation is all about and then leave it to throughout the panel to um, give brief statements um, regarding some of the issues that the case uh, brings to light. Um, if, even from what Mira just said and from, and from all the controversy and all the discussion in the press that you read about this issue, you would think that uh, ID requirements are pervasive throughout the United States. Actually, the truth is, is that almost half the states have very minimal voter ID requirements. Um, that uh, apply to a very small number of voters. And these uh, states actually report that they have no greater problems with voter fraud or any of these kinds of issues than any other state. Let me just briefly review for you um, the, state, uh, the state ID laws that are in place. 18 states do require ID for all voters, but they allow for a wide range of both photo and non-photo ID um, uh, identifications, uh, including things like a paycheck, a personal check, a student ID, a Medicaid card, things like this utility bill. Um, four states request all voters show photo ID, but without the photo ID, they can simply fill out an affidavit on the spot at the polling place and cast a regular ballot. Two states require ID from all first-time voters, but again, there's a wide range of ID that they can use when they come to the polling place. So the overwhelming majority of states have very lenient voter identification laws, um, and none of them report any more polling place fraud than any place else. Um, Florida also requires uh, photo identification, but it does not have to be government issued. And in addition, if you um, do not have the ID, you can vote a provisional ballot, which will then um, be reviewed by the Board of Elections and verified by them um, with the presumption that you are an eligible voter. So it's really only Georgia and Indiana that require a government-issued photo ID in order to vote. And in Georgia, it's much, much easier to get the so-called free ID that they all talk about than it is in Indiana. So let me then turn to, to the Indiana ID law and, and talk to you a little bit about why it's so contentious and, and so troubling. Um, Indiana passed the most draconian, uh, restrictive voter ID law in the country. It requires every voter to present a current photo identification issued by the state of Indiana or by the United States. If you don't have an ID with you, you don't vote, um, basically, period. I've made the um, rules that the Secretary of State has set forth for getting ID um, I, that you should have gotten it on the table in the back, um, which should show you how incredibly daunting it is. Um, basically, if you don't have a current driver's license or a passport, you've got a lot of problems voting. Um, in order to get the so-called free ID, which is supposedly the answer to all the problems, you have to go to a DMV during working hours and present a primary document, a secondary document, and a proof of residency or two primary documents, or one proof of residency document. The only items that count as primary documents essentially are a birth, original stamped birth certificate or a passport. Now, many people don't have an original birth certificate at home. I certainly don't myself, and only about a quarter of Americans have passports. So the voter without a birth certificate then has to go out and buy 
a, a copy or a, a, of their uh, birth certificate, which costs in Indiana between $12 and $20, and a lot more if they were not born in Indiana. And uh, in the ultimate catch-22, in order to get the birth certificate, they may have to present all sorts of other kinds of ID. So you're really in a troublesome situation in that case. And more troubling still is that in Indiana, under the Indiana law, there's absolutely no recourse if you don't have that ID. Unlike the other states that I mentioned where you can fill out an affidavit and then be able to cast a regular ballot, Indiana doesn't have any kind of backup measure like that. If the voter comes to the polls without the right kind of ID, at least the kind of ID that the poll worker thinks that they should have, um, they can't vote by regular ballot. Instead, they have to come back to the election offices within 10 days after the election and either present the suitable ID or uh, sign an affidavit swearing to their indigency, which is completely undefined by the law, and, and they have to swear to that under a penalty of perjury. Um, I should also note that um, there was a recent study that showed that about 10 percent of Indiana voters don't have the requisite ID for voting purposes. So that's the universe that you're talking about. Now, throughout the country, there has been a great deal of litigation about this. and. Um, Although you might think that universally ID laws have been upheld by the courts, that also is not completely true. Um, in Georgia, uh, in the early rounds, um, the, the law was actually struck down, and the federal court initially suspended the requirements for the November 2006 election, but subsequently dismissed the case and allowed the ID requirements to go into effect. That um, litigation is still pending. Um, the plaintiffs have appealed to the 11th Circuit. Um, in Arizona, it was a less strict uh, ID law in question. You could show two non-photo IDs. Um, there, the, the Supreme Court overturned the Ninth Circuit Court order um, enforcement of the law. Uh, the Ninth Circuit Court have affirmed uh, the denial of injunctive relief, and that, too, continues to be litigated, litigated at the trial level. Um, in Albu Albuquerque, New Mexico, they also passed a photo ID law just for that city. The trial court there struck down the ID provision, finding no evidence of fraud and therefore no important state interest that was furthered. Uh, the defendants there have uh, appealed to the Tenth Circuit. And in Missouri, uh, their photo ID law was struck down by the state trial court, and then uh, that was affirmed by the Missouri Supreme Court, with the court finding that the requirements uh, uh, imposed a severe burden and therefore there was no compelling state interest. Now, in none of the cases in which ID requirements were upheld were the um, states able to find a single case of polling place fraud that a voter identification requirement would have addressed. However, uh, Republican-appointed uh, judges have not required them to do so, applying what is at best a rational basis test to these laws. Um, this includes Judge Posner in the 11th Circuit who applied a very low level of scrutiny to the Indiana law and, in fact, held that although he conceded there were a number of people who would not be able to exercise their right to vote, there wouldn't be all that many of them, and therefore it's no big deal, it's constitutional, it's fine. Um, it wasn't important to him the individuals, the, the, the burden on an individual's right to vote, but rather how many people would be affected by the law. Um, let me just quote for, for you for a second from Judge Posner's opinion upholding the voter ID law. He said, even though it is exceedingly difficult to maneuver in today's America without a photo ID, try flying or even entering a tall building such as the courthouse in which we sit without one, and as a consequence, the vast majority of adults have such identification, the Indiana law will deter some people from voting. A great many people who are eligible to vote don't bother to do so. Many do not register, and many who do register still don't vote or vote infrequently. The benefits of voting to the individual, individual voter are elusive. A vote in a political election rarely has any instrumental value, since elections for political office at the state or federal level are never decided by just one vote. And even very slight costs in time or bother or out-of-pocket expense deter many people from voting, or at least from voting on, in elections they're not much interested in. So some people who have not bothered to obtain a photo ID will not bother to do so just to be allowed to vote, and a few who have a photo ID but forget to bring it to the polling place will say, what the hell, and not vote, rather than go home and get the ID and return to the polling place. No doubt most people who don't have photo ID are low on the economic ladder, and thus, if they do vote, are more likely to vote for Democratic than Republican candidates. He also found that it was no matter that uh, there was no evidence of any kind of polling place fraud in Indiana because the state was free to impose the requirement based on just the hypothetical possibility of a future fraud. Um, so this is what the case may then come down to. Whether the court agrees with this view of voting rights, um, finds the burden of the ID requirement is not severe, and hence does not require strict scrutiny. 
Then using the test employed under the Burdick case, which we, I'm sure, will talk more about, which we can go into more detail, will they use a lower standard of scrutiny, and what will that standard be? And even if the Supreme Court agrees with Posner's approach to evaluating the burden, will they require the state to present any evidence that the law furthers the state's interest in preventing fraud? Courts to date have not been requiring the states to make such a showing at all in order to meet the constitutional test set out by the Burdick case. And now I'm going to turn it over to John Greenbaum, who is the um, director of the Voting Rights Project at the Lawyers Committee for Civil Rights, who's going to lay out for you some of the broader issues involved in the ID cases. John? Thanks, Tova. Uh, first of all, I'd like to thank the American Constitution Society for putting on this panel and inviting me to serve as a panelist, and my fellow panelist, Tova Wang, who suggested me as a last-minute substitute when a panelist had to back, back out. Uh, Deborah Goldberg from the Brennan Center for Justice, who, uh, whose organization organized uh, the amicus briefs uh, in support of the challenge to the Indiana voter ID law, and Brad Smith, uh, who was chairman of the Federal Election Commission and a frequent commentator on election law issues. Um, the, the, the Indiana case presents a, uh, a scenario where the Supreme Court is going to look at, is going to analyze whether or not a government-issued photo ID law uh, requirement in Indiana violates the fundamental right to vote under the Equal Protection Clause. This case is going to have serious ramifications, not only for government-issued photo ID laws, but also as to what the fundamental right to vote means and to what extent uh, state and local governments have the ability to uh, infringe on that right. Uh, the, in the 1960s, along with a number of legal protections that the Supreme Court developed in that era, one of those was the fundamental right to vote. Uh, and you saw it beginning in cases having to do with, with reapportionment, Baker versus Carr, Reynolds versus Sims, where the Supreme Court looked at the way that, that uh, jurisdictions had re reapportioned um, congressional and legislative seats and said it's way out of balance if you have one district uh, that has a million voters and another district that has 200,000 voters and that everybody's entitled to an equally weighted vote. Then what you saw in the 60s is you saw the Supreme Court go beyond, beyond that analysis in terms of the fundamental right to vote and look at cases in which groups of voters were being fenced out of the process, uh, including military voters being treated differently than, than other, or people who served in the military being treated differently than other voters in a case called Carrington versus Rash. Uh, uh, another case called Kramer versus uh, New York Union School District, uh, where the Supreme Court found that a, a law that required, if you were to vote in school board elections, you either had to be uh, a property owner, you had to have a child in school, and they found that that law was unconstitutional. Uh, another case was a case called Dunn versus Bloomstein, where the Supreme Court found that a Tennessee residency requirement was unconstitutional. And one of the things about those cases in the 60s and the early 70s where voters were being taken out of the process is the Supreme Court eventually came around to the view that you had – that those laws had to su survive what's called strict scrutiny, which in legal – legalese means that it has to serve a compelling – it's necessary to serve a compelling governmental interest. Uh, in fact, it's a very difficult standard for jurisdictions to ever meet and to, and to prove that a law is constitutional. It's similar to the standard that's used if you have a law that's racially discriminatory on its face. As uh, in the early 90s, the Supreme Court looked at, at a case called Burdick, which involved uh, a Hawaii restriction on write-in voting. And the plaintiffs in, in the Burdick case argued that strict scrutiny should apply to this law, and the majority of the Supreme Court disagreed, and and said that you have to you have to look at these you have to look at these laws you have to do a, a two-level analysis of restrictions on on voting under the fundamental right to vote. If the law creates a severe burden on the fundamental right to vote. And the court didn't go into detail in terms of defining what's severe other than referencing the prior cases. It said that in that situation you have strict scrutiny and it's going to be very difficult 
for the jurisdiction to show that the law is justified. If the law is not severe, the court said you've got to apply uh, a, a different form of balancing test. The court did not provide a lot of direction as to how that balancing test is supposed, is supposed to work. And in fact, you see lower courts applying that balancing test very differently in a lot of the cases that have followed. Now, since that 1992 decision, most of the cases in which the court has looked at the fundamental right to vote have involved cases like restrictions on, on candidates in cases like the Hawaii right and voting requirement that's, that, went, that went to issues r related to regulations that created some restriction on either uh, a candidate's rights or on, on a voter's rights, but didn't involve a situation where you had a law that prevented somebody from voting entirely. And this is really the first case where that, where that issue is, has come up. And so we're going to, this opinion is likely to go a long way in terms of determining how broad that fundamental right to vote is. If you look back to the cases from the 60s and 70s, for example, uh, that fundamental right to vote seems to be something that's very vibrant and very strong. If on the other hand, you look at some of the lower court opinions that have come out uh, in, in, in these government issued photo ID cases, such as Judge Posner's opinion, in the Seventh Circuit, it would seem to suggest that the government's going to have a lot of latitude on restricting the right to vote. Uh, uh, so in terms of the law, in terms of the law in question, as Tova mentioned earlier, you have a variety of different uh, variety of different uh, voter identification laws throughout the country that in a lot of states what's required is some form of identification either photo or non-photo, it can be utility bill, it could be, uh, it could be a, a letter from the government, it could be a driver's license, it could be a whole range of things. And if you look at the Help America Vote Act that Congress passed in 2002, first-time voters who vote by mail have a requirement that they have to show some form of identification. But again, the types of identification that they, that they can show are very broad. One of the things that we began to see after the 2004 election is the beginning of very restrictive um, identification laws, namely laws that <clears throat> only allow for government-issued photo identification. And we saw those laws passed in three states, Georgia, Indiana, and Missouri. Um, as Tova mentioned before, the, the Georgia law, the first Georgia law that was passed in 2005 uh, was initially struck down by the federal court um, as, as a poll tax because it required people to pay to get their ID as well as uh, a violation of the equal protection, of uh, fundamental right to vote under the Equal Protection Clause. Um, Georgia went back, um, made some changes to the law, provided for free ID, made the ID more available, and the district court, after originally issuing a, a preliminary injunction motion uh, that kept the law from going into effect for 2006, actually came back down in 2007 and came out with, a, came out with an opinion which said that the law did not violate the fundamental right to vote under the Equal Protection Clause. And, and uh, you know, I'm one of the, to, to confess, I'm one of the lawyers representing the plaintiffs in that case. Another one of the, and then you have Missouri, in which a, a state court action was brought, and the Missouri State Court, su State Supreme Court, found that the law violated uh, mis the Missouri equivalent of uh, the Equal Protection Clause. And then the third case is the Indiana case, uh, which the trial court on summary judgment um, found that uh, the law uh, did not violate the fundamental right to vote under the Equal Protection Clause. You had a divided uh, Seventh Circuit, which ruled two to one, that uh, the law did uh, did not violate the Equal Protection Clause over a very vigorous dissent um, from from Judge Evans, uh, and then you had uh, the the uh, appellants in that case then sought to have the whole Seventh Circuit hear the case um, in what's called an en banc proceeding, and. The Seventh Circuit as a whole decided not to hear the case, 
but several judges on the Seventh Circuit wrote an opinion uh, that both said, number one, the whole Seventh Circuit should have heard the case as, a, as an entire circuit, and number two, that we think that this, that this law um, actually does violate the fundamental right to vote under the Equal Protection Clause. Um, the Supreme Court's going to be hearing the case uh, next week, as you know, and uh, Deborah and Brad, I think, are going to go into some of the arguments on, on both sides that are being made. Yeah, um, let me introduce Deborah Goldberg, who's the director of the Democracy Program at the Brennan Center for Justice at NYU Law School um, that has not only written um, one of the major amicus briefs in the case, but has been coordinating a lot of um, the efforts to uh, draft other amicus briefs as well. Thank you, Tova. Um, I've been asked to explain the arguments on the petitioner's side uh, in five minutes. Um, so I'm going to try to do that. Um, obviously, I'm expecting there will be questions that we can get into in greater detail later. Um, I want to pick up first by talking about the standard of review, which I think is going to be something that's going to be importantly in contest in this case. Uh, as John mentioned, the standard is derived principally from a case called Burdick, and the court has, has determined that the standard of review in election law cases and voting rights cases varies with the severity of the burden that is imposed on the plaintiffs in the case. Um, where the burden is severe, and severe is in the eye of the beholder very often, uh, then you get strict scrutiny. Um, but even where the burden is not severe, uh, the Supreme Court has said that the court, and I'm quoting, must not only determine the legitimacy and strength of each of the state's in asserted interests, it also must consider the extent to which those interests make it necessary to burden the plaintiff's rights. So the petitioners are arguing that there must be some real evidence, you know, not just speculation, not just allegations, not just fear, um, that a law is necessary to pre prevent what is really a documented problem, not just a matter of unproven allegations or fear. In applying this standard, uh, the petitioners argue three things. First, that the burden is severe, and so therefore the scrutiny ought to be strict. Secondly, even if the, if the uh, scrutiny is not strict, um, the interests that the state has asserted are bogus. And finally, that even if this, the interests could be deemed to be legitimate, that the law is not tailored to prevent any actual fraud. So I want to talk about each of these briefly in turn. First of all, the burden. Uh, the courts below, and you'll often hear, see in the briefs allegations, that the petitioners could not find a single person who was actually affected by this law. Um, that is manifestly not the case. One uh, issue that they faced was that this challenge was filed before the law actually went into effect. So they, it is true that they could not find somebody who had already been disenfranchised by this law. It had not been in effect yet. But there is ample evidence in the record that people would be, that the petitioner's members would be, that the petitioner's constituents would be. And since that time, there have been studies done specifically in Indiana, and there have been elections in Indiana that have been able to document the actual disenfranchisement of people because of this law. And I would direct you, actually, to one of the respondents' briefs, the Marion County brief, where they point out that in a municipal election, um, in an off year, low salience, there were 32 um, provisional ballots that were not counted because uh, the voters who, who cast those ballots um, did not make it on a second trip to the election agency to provide the documentation that's necessary to make that ballot count. And these were, for the most part, people who had voted in many elections in the same precincts previously. So there was no question that they were legitimate voters. The problem was simply that they could not provide the documentation. And it's important to focus on the fact that Tova mentioned that this is a law that singles out a very specific type of documentation that many people do not have. Many people do have it. Um, you know, in fact, you know, most of the upper uh, middle classes, um, well-educated uh, public do have this ID. But 
national studies show that between 10 and 12 percent of the American public do not have a driver's license, and a quarter, only a quarter, have a passport. And that means what we're talking about is if the Indiana law were upheld, and if it were applied nationally, we would potentially disenfranchise about 21 million people. That is certainly enough to swing an election. Uh, in Indiana, the number is actually higher. And uh, the most recent study of Indiana voters has shown that about 13 percent of registered voters don't have the necessary ID. And if you look at particular demographic groups, it goes even higher. Um, for example, African American registered voters do not have this ID um, to the extent of about 22 percent of that population. So we're talking about you know, a sizable burden on the voters in Indiana. Um, in addition to, you know, simply the po potential of being completely disenfranchised, there are other burdens that are mentioned in the, in the case that we can mention and that have been alluded to, whereby if you have to, you know, if you have to cast a provisional ballot, you then also have to make a second trip in order to bring in the documentation. Most other states, if you don't have the documentation, allow you to fill out an affidavit on the spot. Um, Indiana insists that you make a second, second trip. And of course, these are people who are making a second trip who don't have driver's licenses. So they're paying for some kind of transportation in order to effectuate their fundamental right to vote, unless they have some friend who can drive them or something. Um, OK, secondly, the, in, the state interests. Uh, the state admits that Indiana has never had a case of fraud that this voter ID could prevent. and. We at the Brennan Center have gone through approximately 250 citations to reports about alleged fraud that are in the amicus briefs filed and, this, and the briefs filed by the respondents. And our review has shown that there is not a single proven case of in-person impersonation fraud that this voter ID provision could prevent, not one. Um, there are some unapproven cases, nine out of approximately 400 million votes cast since 200, 2000. And that is after a very vigorous search by the Department of Justice over a period of six years to try and ferret out um, voter fraud. So the type of fraud that voter ID would, would prevent. And impersonation fraud is the only type of fraud that voter ID would prevent. Simply does not happen. Or at least there's no evidence in the record or elsewhere of a serious, any serious problem with this particular type of voter ID. What the respondents tend to do instead, and this brings me to my third point about the tailoring of the requirement, is refer to other types of fraud, to vote buying, to fraud on voter registration groups, to ballot stuffing, and to absentee ballot fraud. And these types of fraud do exist, and we should be concerned about them. But voter ID won't do anything to address them. There are other mechanisms in place, moreover, that are far less burdensome than the voter ID requirement here that could address these problems. And um, I will refer you, if you, you'd like some additional documentation, on the, on the Brennan Center's website. Um, there are policy papers that is distinguish seven alternatives to voter ID. And I can also direct you to um, the, the new study that we've done of all the briefs. Um, there are, on the table in the back, um, there's a three-page summary of our findings. Um, the underlying um, memo that describes the um, claims in the briefs and debunks those claims is actually 77 pages long, and so I doubt very much that there will be too many people who want to weed through all of the detail. But it does um, give you a flavor for the types of claims that have repeatedly been made um, and uh, the, the extent to which they might actually be addressed by voter fraud. And it also addresses um, some of the claims that have been made in the briefs about um, the, you know how easy it is to to get voter to get voter ID and and what it's actually required for um, across the, the, uh, the United States right now. So uh, those are the three basic points that are in both of the briefs, and um, I'll pass it over to Brad to talk about the response. <laughs> 
Thank you, Deborah. Um, let me just introduce Brad Smith, who currently is a professor of law at Capital University Law School and was an FEC commissioner from 2000 to 2004 and was the chairman of the FEC from 2004 to 2005. Uh, thank you, Tova, and thank you for inviting me uh, here um, to speak to the ACS. I always like to say I'm one of the few Clinton appointees who gets to uh, appear regularly at Federalist Society events, and I'm one of the few Republicans who appears at ACS events. Um, f I'm, this is a quote. A Kings County grand jury report re found uh, – I'm sorry, a King County grand jury report over – I can't read my own writing here. I wrote this down. Recorded a 14-year pattern of voter fraud. Individuals voted under fictitious names and in the names of dead people. In a single legislative race, approximately 1,000 bogus voter registration cards were filed. One particularly industrious constituent had been voting illegally since 1968, sometimes casting more than 20 ballots in an election. It is time to focus on reforming the process, particularly now that we have seen how easy it is to vote illegally. That's former Democratic Congresswoman Elizabeth Holtzman, former DA of Kings County, writing in the New York Times in 1988. Okay, obviously there's voter fraud. I mean, we know that there is, and this is not a secret, and you can say all you want, there's not a single demonstrated evidence, but we know that there is, we, okay? Um, just as we know that even though there's not a single plaintiff who actually wanted to vote but could not vote in either the Georgia case or the Indiana case, we know that these laws will mean that some people will not vote, okay? So we can kind of get past the, the, the kind of silliness, you know? Now, there is no way that these laws, however, the fact that there's not a single plaintiff in these cases who wanted to vote and could not is very meaningful. It suggests to me that there's absolutely no way, I mean, no way, it's absurd to argue that 21 million Americans are going to be disenfranchised by these laws. Does anybody here really believe that, and yet you can't find any plaintiffs to come forward, even in the Georgia case where they've now had elections, and say, yes, I couldn't vote because of these laws? And does anybody really believe that out of the last 400 million ballots cast in the United States, there have only been nine fraudulent ballots? I don't think anybody really believes those things. And if you do, <laughs> my comments are not addressed to you because I don't, to be honest, take you as a serious person. Those are simply not serious arguments to be made. Now, let's look at what we have in this case. I've been very skeptical, and I've voiced that skepticism, that there is very much fraud of the kind that would be prevented by voter ID laws. And in that respect, I agree with the plaintiffs in these cases, and I'm very sympathetic uh, to the arguments that they make. I think that they are, are, are raise some legitimate issues. But the opening point for a claim of a violation of one's constitutional rights typically involves showing that one's rights have been violated. And that requires coming up with some people, some serious people, to argue that you've not been able to vote and that this is a real problem. And again, I don't think that we see much of that being the case. Uh, there are, again, as I say, almost certainly some. Now, in this scenario, I suggest it would be unwise for the court at this point to step in and begin saying to states that you may not have these kinds of laws. It may turn out that I'm wrong, and it may turn out that 21 million people will be disenfranchised. And it may turn out that many less would be disenfranchised, but still enough for us to be seriously worried about it. Maybe 50,000, maybe 100,000 would be enough. I don't think we'd get there, but, but we might get there. Um, and maybe a lower number. And in that case, the court could certainly come in at a later date and determine that based on a factual record that, is de that has been developed, there's reason to believe that these laws unduly uh, restrict voter rights. But we don't have that evidence now. In fact, we're at a point where we are just beginning to get the first studies coming in of the effect of these laws on voter turnout. And some of those studies have indicated that there's some problems, and other studies have indicated that these laws have no effect on voter turnout at all. And a study by Jeffrey Milo at the Truman School of Government at the University of Missouri indicates that these laws actually may increase voter turnout, particularly in uh, precincts that have large percentages of Democratic voters. And his hypothesis is that people do this because it gives them more confidence in the system and that fraud will not be an issue in the system. And this is an issue, perhaps it makes sense, because for the past seven years, there has been a concerted effort uh, in parts of the Democratic Party to argue that elections are being routinely stolen. 
And if people think their elections are being stolen, they may be less likely to vote. And if they see a law that seems to, to most people, make some common sense attempt to address that, they may be more likely to turn out and vote. Now, it's tempting in this kind of case to err on the side of protecting the right to vote. I mean, it's, it's a pretty important right, okay? Very tempting to err on that side of things. But what we have to realize here is that to err on the side of the right to vote is to err on the side of allowing the votes of legitimate voters to be diluted by the votes of fraudulent voters. That's what that means. When we frame it that way, it doesn't sound nearly so appealing. Indeed, to err on the side of the right to vote may be to uphold these laws. And this is the area where we have very little good data, again, as to how many legitimate voters are not able to vote because of these laws versus how many illegitimate voters are prevented from voting because of these laws. We can look at a number. We can say, well, 32 people in Indiana didn't go back and cast their provisional ballot. Well, why would you? Election's over. Your candidate lost by more than 32 votes or more than one vote. I don't think many people would do that. If we had under our campaign finance laws, you know, we allowed uh, people to start speaking in unrestricted about candidates in the month after the election, I don't think most people would care a whole lot. They want to run ads before the election. People want to vote when they don't know the outcome. It's not necessarily worth a trip down when you do know the outcome. So I'm not particularly impressed by that kind of thinking or, or, or that type of, of evidence. I suggest that uh, what we have here, and I think uh, something that uh, is, is worth consideration, is that voter ID laws make sense to most Americans. Polls show that up to 80% of Democrats support voter ID laws. Most people I know are surprised that we don't have voter ID laws. Uh, and they presume that that's one of the most common sense things that one could find. And I've made it a point, not that my little personal sample is statistically valid, but I've made it a point to talk to Democrats and independents and libertarians and specifically to ask them. And I've not found anybody who's particularly offended by the idea. Why is this? I liken it to the theory of uh, broken windows, the theory that was popular in fighting crime in the 1990s, the idea that if you clean things up, if you don't allow needles to be laying around the park, if you don't allow too much graffiti and litter to build up, people have confidence in their public sphere and they're more willing to participate in it and that itself begins to clear it up. And I think there's some truth to that. Certainly voter ID laws will prevent some voter fraud. Probably not a whole lot, but certainly some. And certainly voter ID laws, uh, not just in, in impersonation fraud, but also the cases of people who may uh, double vote in juris different jurisdictions, people who may be registered because they own property or homes, both in New York and Florida. And they may double vote or maybe more likely they just decide which race state they want to vote in based on the race, uh, which race seems more exciting that year. Um, Voter ID laws, I think, at the polling places would be useful in preventing uh, intimidation of voters at the polls and so on. If people know that folks are routinely checking ID, it makes people just kind of say, well, this is an important thing. Something's going on here. I could be asked for my ID. What am I doing here if I'm not a legitimate voter? Um, it lets people know that elections are being watched and operated in a reasonable fashion. We know that voter registration fraud is substantial, and we know that outdated voter lists are substantial. I think knowing that you have to get an ID that you're going to be checked will help people help to keep voter registration lists up to date, as people will make sure that their addresses and so on are kept up to date at the uh, registration list. I think that we will find, uh, generally speaking, that the recognition that elections are sort of just as important an orderly event as buying a pack of cigarettes will in fact have some minor beneficial effect on elections. And I think it would be a mistake at this point for the court to jump in and stop this on such a, uh, I can think of no other word for it, than colossally weak record as the plaintiffs have put in a case here. I want to point out that the district courts in both Georgia and Indiana threw out the plaintiffs' expert reports, which came up with these numbers like 20 million people and so on. In Indiana, they suggested there'd be like 989,000 people, I think, that would be disenfranchised. And the entire voting age population of the state is 4.6 million. And, and the judge just found the reports not credible and, and threw them out as evidence in these cases. So I think there are many burdens on the right to vote. Registration itself is a burden on the right to vote. It costs you money to go get registered. It takes you time to go get registered. Some people will not vote because it's not worth it. 
just as some people, some of these people who we say don't have IDs, well, how many of them can't get the IDs if they want to put the extra time into it? We know that uh, the number of polling places burdens the right to vote. If we reduce the number of polling places by one, people have to travel farther. It takes them more time. It costs them more money. It's a burden on the right to vote. Are these people disenfranchised? But some might, as Justice Posner said, say, what the hell, and turn around and go home. Which is, by the way, one of the great things about Justice Posner, or Judge Posner's opinion. It's one of the few judicial opinions you'll ever read using the phrase, what the hell. But uh, we know that if you reduce the number of machines by one, it burdens the right to vote. And that little bit longer line will make some person decide, what the hell, and go home. In other words, there are many things that arguably make it harder for people to vote and may make them not vote. And they are not all constitutional violations. So I would suggest that in this case, the, the proper approach for a court would be a wait and see attitude. Let's see these laws go into play. There's not really any evidence that they're depressing voter turnout. There's not, I think, any serious evidence that there are large numbers of people who are being denied the right to vote. Uh, we do know that they are capable of catching at least some types of fraud that we do know does occur. And they may have other salutary effects as well. But the bottom line that you might gather from my comments, if you've stick, stuck with me, is that there may be much less at stake in this case than meets the eye. For all the excitement it has generated, for the fact that we have a pack room here today and six uh, cameras and there was a seventh here earlier and so on, the fact is there's very little evidence that there's a lot of voter fraud that these laws will prevent. And there's very little evidence that people are not being able to vote because of these laws. And in the end, this case may be the court's big much ado about nothing case of the term. Thank you, Brad. Um, I'm just going to pick up for a second on that last uh, remark that Brad made and then open it up to questions uh, from you. It, it seems like, uh, notwithstanding um, Brad's remarks, that we may actually be confronting a case in which um, the right to vote is evaluated in a, in a new way and that a new standard for evaluating voting rights cases uh, is established by this court. Um, do you think that's true or do you think, uh, like Brad, that it's um, probably not going to have a big impact? And if you do think it's going to have a big impact, what will that impact be both on other voter ID laws across the country that are not as severe as well as other kinds of voting rights cases? I think the, the impact is is going to be significant, not just in terms of voter ID laws specifically, but in terms of how the court um, evaluates fundamental right to vote claims. Um, earlier you had referenced what Arizona, the Arizona Proposition 200, which has a voter ID component which requires one form of photo identification, two forms of non-photo identification. But in addition to that, another requirement that voters provide proof of citizenship at the time they register to vote. And beyond the voter ID laws, let's say if the court uh, comes down to Indiana's favor, you, you are likely going to see more states looking to pass laws that require voters to pro provide proof, documentary proof of citizenship at the time they register to vote. And um, I, I think that that would actually have a greater impact than the voter ID laws themselves. Um, you know, again, being counsel in the Georgia case, I'm going to dispute a couple of things that Brad has said about the case. W one of the facts that came out in that case, and this was information that was provided by the state of Georgia just prior to the trial, that there are 198,000 registered voters in Georgia based on Georgia's own analysis that don't have a driver's license or um, a what they call non-operator license in Georgia. So they're are going to be a people who are going to be affected uh, by these laws, and and I, I I think we will see that I think we will see that in Georgia uh, in 2008 as we go forward. Deborah, yeah, I would. I mean, a lot will depend on precisely the reasoning that we get in the opinion. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> if the if if the court, if a majority of the court adopts the incredibly cynical attitude toward the right to vote, that you know it really doesn't make such a difference if you have it or not. Um, and so therefore, we don't really need any evidence whatsoever of a real problem here. Um, you know, if, I, it just knowing that there is some out there, whether you can document it or not, is enough. Um, then I think there, we're going to have huge ramifications far beyond um, the voter ID because the fear 
of fraud, the unproven allegations of fraud, are being used to justify voter suppressive measures of a wide variety across uh, across the nation. So we see restrictions on third-party voter registration groups. We see database management policies. Um, we see a, a lot of other types of um, measures that uh, will potentially be upheld in the name of protecting fraud. Um, so I do think that um, dependent upon whether the court's willing to just throw up its hands and you know, not look closely at all at what the state's doing and simply defer to its um, assertion that there's a problem or there might be a problem and that even though there's never been a problem and they can't actually find a problem that the voter ID provision actually will address, that's good enough. Um, it, we will, um, it, it could potentially transform, I think, election law uh, in this country. I, I, I want to point out, uh, Jonathan made a point that, for example, that in Georgia there's 198,000 people who don't have ID, and so he says there are people, and this is his exact word, who would be affected by this. That's exactly right, people who would be affected by it. Affected, uh, do I need to point out, is not the same as disenfranchised. People are affected by voter registration laws. Is it unconstitutional to have voter registration laws? That prevents some people in this country from voting, and there's no doubt about it. Probably far more people prevented by voter registration laws than prevented by photo ID. Are those laws unconstitutional? Uh, and if there's no evidence of impersonation fraud, what state purpose is really served by voter registration? I mean, we need to think about these things and think them on, on down through the process. Every burden on the right to vote, or on any right, is not of constitutional dimension. And I would be much more impressed by the arguments of the Brennan Center were they to take that approach that they don't like sort of nebulous burden on something like campaign finance reform, where on the basis of the appearance of corruption, they have vigorously lobbied to suppress the rights of people to free speech and campaigns that are not ephemeral, where there are specifically identifiable people who are prosecuted and pay fines regularly. We can probably for have a debate over that. Well, I don't want to do it, but I, but, I, but, I, I, but I want to point out that there's this sudden reversal in, in a case that doesn't seem very strong on it. Uh, I, I feel very comfortable in saying uh, that while I'm uncomfortable with the idea of proceeding on on the, the weak evidence the state has, in a sense, there has to be the, that evidence that something's burdened. So I think the positions can be reconciled, but it's very hard to reconcile the position the Brennan Center takes here with the position they've taken on other voting issues, like campaigns. Okay. Since, since there's the been an ad hominem <laughs> attack, I think I, I did, we'll, we'll move on to questions. There's really a big difference between the justifications that have been offered for the regulation of money in, in politics and the justification here. And that is that there actually is a lot of documented evidence of corruption in, as a result of money. There was an ample legislative record that was built, for example, in, de in, in, in developing uh, the record for the Bipartisan Campaign Fund Reform Act of, uh, by people who were involved in the process of selling access for money, of, of the influence of money. There have been prosecutions for acceptance of uh, campaign contributions in exchange for favors. That is very different than here. We're not talking about an appearance of fraud here. There is no underlying actual fraud that anybody can point to that a voter ID would prevent. And so I think that, you know, if we want to talk about flip-flopping, I mean, I think that the, the allegations can be made in both directions. On, on the one hand, we, the, the, the uh, opponents of campaign finance reform strenuously argue that you must have, you know, actual evidence of, of quid pro quo corruption before there's any legitimacy, but when it comes to voter fraud, they're perfectly happy to have a very differential approach to government. The, the, so not, it goes, this isn't relevant. No, I'm not going to do that, but I want to, let, let me add one other thing, though, to the, to the main question uh, that I wanted to address here. First, again, let, let's stop saying there's no evidence of this fraud, right? Again, go read Elizabeth Holtzman in the New York Times, okay? There's evidence of the fraud. Uh, but let's, you know, I think the, the first question was, what would be the impact of this decision? And part of the impact will be 
as I think Deborah said, how broadly the court decides the case, what kind of language the court uses. I think in this case, the plaintiffs have probably made a very unwise decision in appealing the case and probably in bringing the cases in the first place on such a thin record because this is exactly the kind of case where you get bad opinions because we don't really know very much. And that's why I would urge the court to take a restrained approach that would leave the Indiana law intact as it stands uh, and reserve the opportunity to revisit this issue if it ever turns out that plaintiffs can bring a case. And I think that would be a, a wise approach for a court to take, a minimalist approach. Let me move two questions from press members, please. Yes. If you could identify yourself. Hi, Maureen well. Robbie with Gannett News Service. I have a question about the 32 voters in Marion County in the mayoral election who didn't return with their um, voter ID on the provisional ballot, so they weren't counted. There were about 106,000 um, people who did vote in that election, so 32 out of 100 some thousand doesn't sound like a lot. Is your argument that even if one person wasn't able to vote, that's too many? Or what, so what do you, what's your standard for, for when too many people are are make it, they found it too difficult to vote. Well, the, you know, the Supreme Court has recognized the right to vote as a personal vote, a personal right. And so there is, you know, the burden should be evaluated on what is the burden on the person who holds that right. It should not be uh, evaluated by how many people are going to be deprived of their right. The extent of the burden is on the individual. Um, so I would say that 32 out of 106,000 is too many. Um, and I probably would be willing to say that when there's no justification that the state can give for uh, a measure, that one is too many. Um, I think that um, I'd be happy to have anybody look back at that Kings County allegations. I would be, I'd be very doubtful that the, uh, what was in there has since been documented to be in-person impersonation fraud. Um, we've looked extensively at these allegations. We have not found proven allegations of that sort, although quotes like that are thrown at us time and time again. Let me uh, add one quick comment for me on that. We should not assume that the 32 people who didn't vote could, were deprived of voting by this law. They may have forgotten their ID that day, and they may have been perfectly able to have had it. And again, as I say, the mere fact that they didn't come back to cast their provisional ballots is not particularly proof of anything. So as I've said throughout, there are definitely people who will not be able to vote because of these laws. And the countervailing provision is that there are definitely people who might commit voter fraud who will not do so because of these laws. And what we have very little information on is what that balance is. And that's why it would be, I think, a mistake for the court to impinge, to dilute the votes of legitimate voters to err on that side. Rather, you know, there's no erring on one side or the other that we can know is the right way to go in the, given the paucity of evidence. I guess I would argue differently that 32 people were deprived of their right to vote in that particular election because had it not been for the law, they would have, their votes would have counted. I guess, you know, that's one of the main things that the court will be looking at is whether it's how many people are affected by the law and burdened by the law as opposed to how much of a burden is placed on an individual voter and what is the appropriate thing to look at um, in voting rights law now. Um, other questions? Yes. Linda Greenhouse from the New York Times. So just parsing the court uh, and facing this and knowing what we know about the Roberts Court's uh, basic skepticism about standing and facial challenges and so on. Um, what do you think is the likelihood that they'll take the, uh, well, sort of the Brad Smith approach, but the approach in the Solicitor General's brief of finding no standing or not an appropriate facial challenge? And would that simply be a fizzle of a case, a deferral to another day, or would that kind of approach to this issue itself be meaningful? I, I think it would be. I, I think it would be meaningful. I mean, one of the, being on the plaintiff's side in these cases, I mean, one of the difficult things is to find people who are willing to be individual plaintiffs um, in, in, in these cases. And, that's, and, and so I, I think that it would have an impact if the, court, if the court did rule on standing grounds and came up with a very tight definition as to what Define standing. One of the things that happened in in the in the Georgia case at the trial is that the court adopted a definition of standing that would make it very difficult um, for us to find plaintiffs in any of these cases. It wasn't just a matter that we had to show that there was a voter who didn't have the identification at all, but we had to show that there was no way that this voter, no way at all that this voter could go down to their voter registration office and get an identification. Um, but yet, 
we had to transport, the voter had to be transported to the courthouse and be able to testify in front of the judge because the judge wouldn't accept affidavits either. So that there are ways, there are ways that by creating really strict rules, for example, on standing, um, that the court could make it very, very difficult in practical terms uh, to succeed in these cases. Yeah, and I would agree with that. I mean, right now, the, you know, we have organizational plaintiffs that are asserting both their own organizational rights and the rights of their members. If the court were actually to say that the Democratic Party, for example, did not have standing here to bring this case because it could not actually, in advance, name a person who was actually going to be disenfranchised, that would be a radical change in standing law that would make it very, very difficult to bring not only election law cases but a wide range of other types of affirmative litigation. Yes. Ken Joseph with the Congressional Quarterly CQ Press. Uh, Mr. Smith, I want to ask if, uh, if the uh, – we, we've heard that 32 people didn't come back to vote and you said, so what? Uh, suppose that the outcome of an election were to depend uh, on um, the votes cast – to be cast that might be cast by provisional ballot voters, for instance, in a big state, in a closely contested presidential election. Would you be so sanguine about uh, – the handling of that collection? Well, again, what we don't know is why those 32 people didn't come back. Maybe they were not eligible voters. Maybe those are 32 instances of electoral vote fraud. We just don't know. So we can't presume those are just great votes that all should have counted. Now, had the election been close, had it been within 32 votes, my guess is more of those people would have taken the effort to come back and vote. Again, you know, it's just as people don't bother to run campaign ads after Election Day, I don't think most people really care about voting after they know their candidate has won or lost. Uh, it's it, it not really worth the effort. Um, so I, I just don't think that the question operates on a premise that is that is realistic. If we have an election that's close, we're going to find out if those people are, are eligible to vote or not, I think. And I, you know, we have to recognize as well at some point that when an election is that close, right, it's a toss-up, you know. And, and uh, there's somebody else that day who didn't vote because on the way to the polls he had a car accident. There's somebody else who didn't vote because he didn't even go cast a provisional ballot because the line was too long and he had to go work or take care of his kids or something like that. So, you know, when the election gets that close, I mean, I'm not suggesting this becomes a trivial issue, but it's not like at that point there's some magical will of the people that would have been determined differently if we had those other five votes. It matters, and it matters in this case. So those 32 votes... Yeah, it, it matters if it's a close race. But if it is, I think you would have found that those folks would have come back. And I don't think you can assume that those are 32 legitimate votes that weren't cast. I mean, that's the whole point of these laws is to prevent people from casting votes that are not legitimate. So do you want to err on the side of allowing fraudulent votes to dilute legitimate votes, or do you want to err on the side of – uh, uh, allowing well, – how do we want to put that? Or do you want to – I guess that's the question. Do you want to err on that side or do you want to err on the side of I don't know what? It's a balance, and we don't have very much data for it. But there's very little data, and, and this is where the plaintiffs have really kind of failed to assert a strong – any kind of constitutional interest here that people are really being denied the right to vote because of these laws. Do you give any credence to the uh, fact that people, if they were therefore caught – I mean, they, these are people now who have actually shown up at the polls – would be um, – subjecting themselves to possible jail time. Well, of course we give credence to that, you know. Uh, but but law enforcement has always been a mix of both after-the-fact enforcement and uh, upfront efforts to warn people not to do things, to uh, preventive efforts. Um, and, and I think we need to, to respect that. At this point, again, it simply would be premature for a court to jump in and say, you know, bind the hands of states in a way that a ruling on this law I think would be likely to do to take steps to deal with various types of fraudulent uh, issues that might come up. I think the problem is with this particular type of fraud, uh, you know, if, 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 for example, you wanted to steal an election, this would not be the way to do it. I mean, you think about all the different steps that you would have to go through if you wanted to use this method to steal an election. You'd have to get a whole group of people who would willing, be willing to p play impersonators. They'd have to memorize the name and other, identifica uh, other identification of identifying information of the voter. They'd have to learn how to mimic the voter's signature because one of the things you do at the polls is you, you sign your name on a poll book. They'd have to travel to the polling place of the voter. They'd have to stand in line 
um, to cast a ballot in the voter's name. They'd have to somehow know that that voter hasn't voted already because if they identify themselves as someone who's already voted already, that's going to indicate a problem. And they and what if the poll and what if the poll worker knows who the registered voter is? That again would subject them to uh, criminal penalties. So you think about it in reality, and and the reason why you don't have document documented cases of this type of fraud is it just doesn't make sense. Other questions? Um, Monica Schneider. I don't actually get to write for any great publications. But I was curious, actually, if the court is going to, you think the court will take the time to clarify the Burdick test in this? Uh, having read that case, when I read it, the, the impression I get from what, what the balancing test is supposed to do is something akin to intermediate scrutiny. And I feel that the courts have applied it on more of a rational basis um, a manner. And do you think that the court will take the time to clarify that and perhaps correct that? I never make predictions about what the court is going to do. <laughs> I can certainly make, you know, I can certainly express a hope that we would get some mm -hmm. clarity there. Mm -hmm. um, you know, right now, the way the verdict test is, has been applied is, is, is something that you have to sort of induce from the, the body of precedent that we have before. It would be very helpful if we had a little bit more of an express explanation, but whether or not the court will give it to us, um, you know, I don't know. I, I did want to respond to the, the repeated argument that um, long lines are a problem, registration is a problem. You know, somehow the fact that we have tolerated a lot of burdens means that another burden we should just accept without question. And, um, you know, I love someday, someday Brad and I will sit up here and debate whether or not we need voter registration requirements um, or whether or not we certainly need them implemented in the way they are in the United States as opposed to the way they are in places where the, where the government actually takes the responsibility of ensuring that people have the right to vote. But um, at this point, um, you know, I, I do think that if we're going to layer on additional burdens on top of the ones that we've already imposed, we should have a pretty damn good reason for doing so with some real empirical support for the problem that we're trying to address. And if people really wanted to, you know, the, the broken window theory, um, you know, assumes that you actually have broken windows um, or you have, you know, whatever, you know, you have graffiti that you want to clean up. And that by, you know, cleaning that all up, you're going to deter people who otherwise would do things. You know, after six years, we don't have any evidence of that at this point. Um, and so we're now in the position where you're using a device that focuses very, very narrowly and on an unproven and extremely difficult and not very, you know, pra you know intelligent a type of voter fraud. And we're not addressing much more serious things. So if you, if you want to, to give people confidence in the integrity of the system. There are much, much more meaningful measures that one could take than this. This is not going to make people feel safe about their system when they know that absentee ballot fraud or ballot stuffing or all the other things that actually have been documented are going totally unaddressed by, by the states. Instead, they're picking a particular type of voter ID that they know particular groups do not have and they're using that as a substitute for serious measures to address. Let me follow up on that and ask fraud. to what extent um, is this a case of where you have discriminatory uh, impacts and, or possibly even intent? How much of a part of the case is that? I, I think not so much in the, in the particular facts in Indiana. I mean, not for example, not talking about a, a pure race discrimination case. I don't think the, the plaintiffs have made, have made that type of case. I mean, there's no doubt, though, that, for example, if you, if you look back at the Georgia data, that you clearly see that African Americans and other minority groups and the elderly are disproportionately affected out of that 198,000 registered voters um, that, that – uh, don't have a driver's license or non-operator ID, um, and that and that's you know that's because Georgia keeps racial data that we actually we actually know the answers to that. So there there's no doubt that 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 there are certain groups that are affected um, more than others. I mean it's hard to not be cynical when you 
when when you look at the type of uh, when you look at the justification for these laws and you look at or a lack of justification for these laws and you look at how the, who's affected I mean, a good example is you take a place like Arizona where <clears throat> uh, half the voters either vote early by mail or go into a polling place and vote and if you go in the polling place and vote uh, uh, or, or to the registrar's office prior to the day of election, you vote early, you don't have to show an identification that they use a signature match. They, they match the signature they have on record. And that's the true sig- Indiana and Georgia right. as well. The, 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 right, right. That you, they match the signature. That you, but, and, and even in Arizona, though, it's for in-person voting prior to Election Day. But if you vote on Election Day, you have to have the identification. It just... You know, from a logical perspective, it just doesn't make sense as to as 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 to what is what is being at what positive is being advanced. I guess the other thing is, people. Brad has talked about the confidence that people will have in the process because of these laws. I would argue to the contrary that I think it undermines confidence in the system when you have a certain group, certain number of voters, and particularly those who are poor, elderly, and minority that are being taken out of eligible voters who are taken out of the system because of these laws. I think that that undermines confidence. So if I can address this verdict question a little bit. I mean, first, we don't have evidence that that's the case. We just don't have evidence. The the evidence coming in on voter turnout doesn't show that it has an effect on particular income classes or racial groups or anything. That evidence is just not there. We, We talk about the verdict test. I would like to clarify the Burke test. And, and by the way, I have always, you know, people who know my record in virtually every field, in ballot access and campaign finance and in voter registration, I'm a deregulatory guy. I've been dragooned into this by what I just see as the absurdity of the arguments that are being made against this law. That's really why I'm here today, because it just offends my intellectual sensibilities at some point to hear people say things like 20 million folks are going to be disenfranchised and to hear the allegations accused that folks are tr- using these laws to try to suppress votes and so on. If we use the verdict test, this is a terrible case, unfortunately, to clarify the verdict test. And Deborah may have tipped her hand more than she said, wanted to when she said, maybe someday she and I will get to debate whether or not we should have voter registration. Because that's exactly the problem the Supreme Court's going to face. The Supreme Court will have to decide, are we going to apply a real strict scrutiny to this and strike this down? What will that do for voter registration? And maybe the folks at the Brennan Center are there. But I don't think the people at the Supreme Court are, and I don't think the vast majority of the American people who support voter ID laws are there yet. And so, you know, in that sense, this is a terrible kind of case to, to try to push the argument that we need a tougher standard under the verdict test. It's a very bad case to do that, and it's going to be destructive to broader goals that actually I suspect that I share with the other panelists here. And I don't see why the court would want to rule in that direction. Um, yes, other questions from the press. Yes, sir. Uh, I'm Victor Stone, and uh, Mr. Greenbaum's question uh, or comment a moment ago uh, really sort of crystallized to me what I, what I felt here, and that is that there is a segment of the legislatures that want some kind of biometric identifier because of maybe just allegations which can't be substantiated that this election or that election was stolen and they see us moving both in, as was explained, in airport security gates and in big buildings, to some kind of biometric. Would you feel the same way, and I guess this is uh, for for Ms. Goldberg as well, would you feel the same way if each polling place had a little desk on the side where if you didn't have the right ID, you went over, and they let you sit down and fill out an absentee ballot with the penalties of perjury and everything you had to subscribe to it before you signed, or if they had a little desk and they immediately made a photo ID that with uh, facial recognition now they could scan later if they wanted to and gave you an ID right there and they did it in less than a minute. I've had IDs made temporarily in buildings when I've gone in and nowadays they make them really fast and and it provided a biometric um, uh, 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 guarantee of some sort for the election uh, boards that they felt they were doing uh, making uh, uh, some, giving some security to those who walked in the door. I, I get the feeling, although I wasn't sure, that you're against any kind of uh, serious biometric uh, identifier at all. It, it, am I overstating it? Yes. <laughs> I mean, I'm not sure that a photo ID counts as a biometric ID, first of all. But even if it did, 
you know, certainly the, the burden would be reduced if people were actually going to get it on the spot immediately and were going to be enabled to vote. What we're concerned about is the disenfranchisement of people who don't have ID. And, you know, the unfortunate situation is that states aren't doing that. No one has proposed to do that. So we are facing situations where, you know, you actually can, you know, 32 people who, you know, we do know they were legitimate voters. They voted before in the very same precincts, you know, and they were not able to vote. And, um, you know, so I think that, you know, if everybody had the ID and if they were not discriminatorily uh, the, the, the rules were not discriminatorily enforced, which we also know they are. Um, you know, it would be much less of a problem. The HAVA ID requirements that have been put in place for first-time voters who register by mail, you know, we recognize are much less of a problem than what we have in Indiana. The, the, the problem we have right now is, is with a very specific type of ID that requires a very specific type of documentation that we know certain people don't have. And I just want to come back to you know, the, the one the one area in which there have been some allegations about um, discriminatory application of the law, of course, has not been intentional racial discrimination, but partisan discrimination. Of course, one of the cases has been brought on the grounds that this is in, um, has some partisan motivation, or that at least the appearance, the the the, uh, the uh, partisan voting that goes on in this should give rise to a higher level scrutiny of these kinds of laws, um, so that they aren't put into into place simply as a, a way of controlling who gets to vote and who doesn't get to vote on the basis of their um, political views. I mean, I guess the closest to what you're talking about are, are the, there are a handful of states like Michigan where if you don't have the ID. Um, and or you forget the idea for whatever reason you don't have it, you can fill out an affidavit ballot swearing that you know you are an eligible voter and that is uh, you, you can cast regular ballot. Other questions, press, please. Um, Tony Morrow with Legal Times. Uh, I wonder if um, anybody could reflect on the fact that seven years after Bush versus Gore, the Supreme Court is now willing to get back into a, a, a case that uh, could decide a presidential election, perhaps. Uh, especially since the Seventh Circuit was very explicit in saying that the, these laws would have differential impact mm -hmm. on Democrats and Republicans. It's a, it seems like a, it's at least being set up as a, as a very partisan case, and yet the court was willing to get into it. Brad, do you have something to say? Well, I'll just say, uh, um, you know, as I said earlier, I, I think in a certain ways I, I suspect, and I could be horribly wrong here because obviously – Many partisans in both parties seem to think I'm wrong, but I suspect that this case will not have much practical effect on, on who votes. I do find it interesting that the plaintiffs in these cases love to grab Posner's comment about, oh, this is probably going to affect the poor and Democrats more, and run with it, although there's really not any evidence for that but excoriate Posner for everything else he said on the grounds that he doesn't have evidence for that. Uh, that's just, to me, an observation. I don't think we really know that these are going to have the partisan effects that people think, and I don't think that the evidence coming in so far is showing that at all. I think it's showing that there's not really much effect. I would just direct you to the study that was done um, of the Indiana voters um, by, uh, by Barreto and his um, cohort there. It's available um, in full on the Brennan Center website to um, examine the partisan impact that uh, the Indiana law is likely to have. And I believe there was a study in Georgia as well that um, I looked at that issue by uh, Bullock, B-U-L-L-O-C-K. And, and while we're saying, again, you know, Jeffrey Milo's study from the Truman Center at, at the University of Missouri finds actually the opposite, that Democratic turnout did better with, with voter ID. I, I would want to just also point out that turnout is the wrong measure. Um, we've only had impact. We've only had these, pla these, these laws in, in effect for one election. So we, we need to be looking at something uh, that other than, than turnout if we're going to get, um, you know, valid studies of the potential impact. And I also want to clarify um, so that I don't seem intellectually um, inferior that no one has ever said that 21 million people will be affected by these laws. What we've said is that if these laws are put into place nationally, potentially they could affect 21 million people because that is the number of people who do not have a, a, a driver's license. Other questions? Yes. Hi, uh, Jim Oliphant, uh, Chicago Tribune. I just want to get back uh, real quick to this issue of standing um, and the idea did you, uh, the, and the failure to obtain sort of living, breathing people who you think will be affected by this. Is that 
because the difficulty of identifying those people and why has that been difficult? Or is it that just this is just simply you didn't think you needed to uh, to reach the standing threshold in this case? Well, just to clarify, I mean, I mean, in Georgia, we found a whole bunch of people. And if in 2006, when, when we moved for preliminary injunction, we submitted a whole raft of affidavits to the to the district court, which at that point the district court credited of actual live people who said, "I don't have I don't have an ID." The court in 2007 said, when we went to trial, said, "You've got to physically bring people to court to testify." I'm not going to grant the motion. The defendant said. You've got to physically bring these people to the court, and the people that were found were 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 from throughout the state. We did bring some people to court, and the people that were brought to court said we don't have the ID, and the judge said, "Well, can't you go down to your county registrar's office and get one?" And you know, it sort of put them in a weird position that here they traveled all this way to the court for them to say, no, there's no way for me that I could go down to the county registrar's office. The court set up a standard where, where, where you had to actually show that there was no way you could do it, as opposed to what we're dealing with here, which is an undue burden standard. Is the burden justified? So, and generally, it is difficult to find these people because, because the, there are people that are going to be less likely to have telephones. Um, uh, they tend to be more mobile or, or seniors. Um, they're poor, uh, and I, and you know, from being out in the field and 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 getting plaintiffs in a variety of civil rights cases, also less willing to kind of put themselves out there, knowing that they're going to knowing that they're going to have to testify. You know, I've had people <clears throat> tell me before. That you know, they're afraid that if 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 I'm a plaintiff in a case suing the state, that the state's going to come back on me. So those are some of the challenges that that we have. But I want to make it clear that we actually did find people um, who signed affidavits and who did testify in court, and I'd be happy to provide you with some of those affidavits that were filed. I, I would also want to say, and this may be may, the one point on which Brad and I actually agree today. Now, I don't think that the record in this case is the best record that might be developed in, you know, against a voter ID provision. Um, certainly there is more that could have been done. Um, but the question isn't whether or not you know, it's the best possible record, but whether on the record that is before the court, the state has justified um, what it has admitted will be a disenfranchising provision. And I think that there's enough record evidence to show the burden, and there's insufficient record evidence to show the justification. Um, you know, would I have litigated it differently? Would Brad have litigated it differently? I'm sure we would have. Um, but that's really not the issue that's before the court. Other questions? Hi, I'm Brian McPherson uh, for uh, Ms. Goldberg. Uh, a lot has been made of the, the 32 people who uh, were not able to substantiate their, their right to vote. Has there been any study as to how many people didn't even bother showing up at the polls because they knew they didn't have the uh, necessary uh, ID? I don't know of any study. It's a very difficult thing to test for. Um, and this, of course, one of the problems with using turnout as a measure um, is uh, and, and there are obviously lots of lots of, lots of different reasons why people do or do not turn out, um, but I don't know of any actual studies of that. Anyone else? Other questions? Okay. Um, if anyone else has any last remarks, last closing items, no, nothing about campaign finance. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Well, thank you all for coming, um, and thanks to our panelists, and thank you to ACS. <laughs>